Echo program. Gastro Echo is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project Echo from the University of New Mexico. And as you guys are, I'm sure, well aware, these sessions are held uh, on a Wednesday every week and have been um, very uh, important to continuing gastro education uh, in, in, in Southern Africa. We've had 54 registrations for this session today on uh, uh, um, uh, liver pathology. Um, Professor Martin Hale from the Department of Histopathology at uh, the University of Edwardesrand will be taking us through cases of vanishing bile duct syndrome, um, uh, secondary to uh, different etiologies. Um, please remember that the chat will be open for questions. Um, and I would encourage uh, that sort of interaction. Professor Hale, uh, over to you. So, so thanks, uh, Bilal. Uh, would you like to present the clinical features of the first patient? Sure, uh, which, uh, uh, just give me the initials. Which uh, one are we doing first? Uh, CDP. So, Ms. CDP, uh, sorry, CDP, um, Mr. CDP, Mr. Then. CDP. Um, uh, let me just pull that up. Uh, it is age and so on. So this is this is quite a fascinating case uh, that we've we we we're, we're currently managing uh, up in Johannesburg. Uh, he he's a fifty eight year old gentleman from Durban that has been referred up previously uh, well. Um, quite, uh, quite, quite, a, quite, a, quite an active gentleman with no prior known liver, uh, liver, liver pathology. He fell ill in June of last year um, during, a, I'm presuming, our Delta uh, wave with, uh, with COVID. He spent 21 days on a ventilator and 81 days in total in hospital. Um, I don't have his exact uh, ventilatory settings, uh, and he was not on uh, not on dialysis specifically. Um, but uh, subsequent to this, in 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 about August, he noted that he was starting to become uh, that much more uh, jaundiced. The respiratory physician got the gastroenterologist involved, and they found quite a marked cholestatic picture with uh, alpha and gamma well over 2,000, and in fact, uh, at times it was up uh, around the four and 5,000. Um, Mr. DePaulo's background is that he's a type two diabetic hypertensive prior MI at the age of 37, that was, that was medically managed. Um, medication wise, he was on a, an ACE inhibitor um, and insulin, uh, Novamix 25. Um, he was placed on ursodeoxycholic acid by the gastroenterologist in Durban and then, and then sent to us. He had uh, an ERCP done that side, which did show um, uh, stricturing disease of his extrahepatic bi uh, biliary tree. Uh, a liver biopsy was then performed to uh, assess what the status of his, uh, of his liver was looking like. We were, we were considering that whether or not this was just a simple secondary sclerosis and cholangitis, secondary to the ICU stay, and whether or not uh, the liver, uh, or just how badly was the liver affected at that stage. Right, thanks, uh, thanks, Bilal. So I'll share my screen. So everybody should be able to see that image, I hope. Yes, we can. Great, thanks, uh, Cheryl. All right, so what we got is a good quality biopsy, and uh, please ignore ignore these areas here. This is where the cover slip has not um, has not properly uh, um, attached to the tissue. So this is not pathology; this is artifact. But uh, what I want to show you <clears throat> is uh, nevertheless uh, readily visible. So the first area in this biopsy, and you can see it's. Uh, it's a, it's a well-presented biopsy, uh, well-cut, nicely stained. So it's, there's, there's plenty of pathology to see uh, in it. So we're just going to start at uh, this end here. And you can see straight away that uh, we've got a bile duct here, 
which uh, shows quite dense periductal fibrosis. We're going to look at that in, in more detail uh, later on, but you can see it's angulated. You can see that we've got attenuation of the epithelium, and this is the typical picture that one sees in sclerosing cholangitis. And um, the, um, uh, there's not much in the way of inflammatory cell infiltration. We we'll look at the special stains uh, just now. And uh, there's certainly um, a number of these uh, portal areas where this, there's one up here, for example, where you can see that there's the beginnings of a little bit of uh, periductal uh, onion skinning type fibrosis. I often say that onion skinning fibrosis is in the eye of the beholder. And uh, some people would say, no, I don't think so. But I think, uh, and that probably I would say that that's not definitive onion skinning. But in the light of uh, what I've just shown you uh, with this here, yeah, I mean, this is that uh, bile duct is, is clearly abnormal. But if one looks at the epithelium and the, uh, the biliary epithelium, you can see that uh, there is attenuation, uh, there's uh, variation in nuclear size. This is high dry, unfortunately, if I just, this is high dry. And you can see that, that the epithelial cells and nuclei look a little bit irregular. Some are small, some are larger. There's a bit of, a te of um, epithelial attenuation there. And then as we go through the biopsy, we can see similar changes occurring in other portal tracts. And uh, if, you, if one looks at this particular portal tract here, you can see that there's an element of inflammatory infiltration. Uh, the bile duct here uh, does show epithelial changes. The nuclei are irregular. And if we look at this particular bile duct here, one can see, in fact, that this, there's a mitosis, which is actually occurring in this, in this cell here. And these are the poles of the mitotic figure, uh, one pole there and the other pole there. So this is a cell which is dividing. As we move down, we come to portal tracts that look like this. And here you can see that um, we've got the artery, another artery there, and I think that's probably also another artery. And what is, uh, what is apparent in this triad is that, is that there is no bile duct. The bile duct has disappeared. And uh, one can be confident about that. Uh, we've got uh, certainly a complete portal tract represented. If we look on the other hand at this portal tract here, one can see that we do have a bile duct. I think that's the artery there. You've got a red, couple of red blood cells in the lumen. And uh, this bile duct is not neat and tidy at all. Uh, we seem to have first lost biliary epithelial cells at the periphery and there's a bit of attenuation uh, there as well. And then as we move to this bile duct here, sorry, this portal tract here, we can see similar changes to the, not the previous one, but the, uh, the one before that, you can see the portal vein, you can see the hepatic arterial and a complete absence uh, of the bile duct. So just having gone through a couple of uh, the portal tracts, one can immediately suspect that there's biliary pathology. The next thing to look at um, is uh, to show you, in fact, before I go there, show another portal tract where we have retention of the bile duct, but here you've got this epithelial attenuation. There's the artery, a little bit of inflammatory cell infiltration lymphocytic inflammatory infiltration in that. And then another portal tract in here, we can see that we've got quite florid bile ductular proliferation. We've got a bit of cholestasis, which is present in zone one. So I think that, uh, you know, our impression then of this is that this particular patient has cholangiopathic pathology. The next step is to say, well, what's actually causing it? So now we're going to look at the parenchyma. And if we look at the parenchyma, and this is zone three, here we've got the central vein there, and um, we can see that there's quite marked intracellular cholestasis. All this greenish brown pigment is intracellular bile. And then accompanying that, there is also an element of um, inflammatory infiltration uh, in zone three as well. 
a little bit of a parasite necrosis as well. Another bile duct going through, in fact, sorry, another two portal tracts, portal tract there and portal tract there. And one can see that uh, the bile duct in both that portal tract there has disappeared. We've only got representation of the vein and the hepatic arteriole. And then the portal tract next door showing you exactly the same changes where there's a complete absence of the bile duct. So I think we can be fairly confident in saying that what we've got here is remembering that we should really have in ideal circumstances uh, one bile duct per portal tract. And uh, the minute you go below, uh, below 0.9 uh, then uh, of um, bile ducts per portal tract, you need to think about paucity or a vanishing bile duct syndrome. And here we've got a bile duct, which I think is probably a native duct, but it shows so it is on the edge of the biopsy. But I think one gets the impression that there's a bit of periductal fibrosis. But certainly if you look here, you can see that you've got attenuation of the epithelium. You've got marked irregularity in the nuclear size and the shape of these nuclei. So putting it all together like a puzzle, I think we, as I said, we can be fairly confident that, uh, that we've got bile duct injury. And here, once again, perivenular uh, cholestasis, uh, quite striking uh, perivenular cholestasis. I'm not sure about that. Uh, this is a hepatic arteriole. Um, there is a vein there. So it's quite a large uh, hepatic arteriole. Sometimes you get these sort of wayward hepatic arterioles without portal structure, without additional portal structures. But I think with the vein and that, uh, we should expect to see a bile duct. But that hepatic arteriole, in fact, is quite large um, and there's no, there's no accompanying that. So that's what we will call an unpaired artery. So now what I want to do is go to the serious red. And the serious red, for those of you who are pathologists, and if you don't do the serious red, I would strongly recommend that you do it. It's a very easy stain to do, and it shows up the collagen very nicely. And here you can see on the serious red that there is portal tract expansion, and uh, that is um, replicated in other areas and of, the, of the liver. You can see portal tract expansion there by fibrosis, and there as well. So there's no real linking. Um, I think there's probably a little bit of septum formation uh, which is taking place, but I'm not sure about definitive linking. And there's that portal tract with that periductal fibrosis that I showed you right at the beginning. And you can see the epithelial attenuation and this dense pericellular fibrosis, at least periductal fibrosis that we saw. So now we're going to look at the orsine stain. And the orsine stain is the next go-to stain as soon as you think that there is a vanishing bile duct syndrome. And if we look at the orsine, right at the end of the biopsy, always go through the whole biopsy. Don't miss anything out because the chances are that that's where the pathology is. And here you can see this intracytoplasmic uh, dark brown to black material there. Also here, this granular material and also well demonstrated here. And this is in the zone one of parasites. There's the portal tract. And We've got more copper there as well. And then I think well demonstrated, this is the portal tract with that dense fibrosis. And it shows you a couple of things. First of all, there's increased elastic tissue because the orsine also stands up elastic tissue and you can see that around the duct. And in zone one, you've got pretty abundant intracytoplasmic copper associated protein. You can see that here. 
So that tells us then this presence of this copper tells us that this is a chronic cholestatic problem. And the finding of copper in a liver biopsy is a, is a sinister finding when it comes to uh, saying or identifying, could this be a copper? One's got to be a little bit careful because alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency globules can also be positive with, this, with the with the orsins. So you've got to be make, make sure that there's no coexistent past positive diastase resistant globules in the zone one hepatocytes. That can occur from time to time. So that's the catch with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. But here we don't have that situation. And here, as I said, sorry, I keep on going to want to go to a higher power, but you can see this, this copper associated protein. Then we move to the CK7. We see that the um, CK7 shows uh, quite marked stem cell metaplasia in zone one, as you see here, and that's present throughout the biopsy. You can see some portal tracts, such as this one here, don't have a native duct. Likewise, if you look at this one here, we can see that this is a native duct there. I'll just get that into the middle of the field. This is a native duct, but you can see there's quite marked stem cell proliferation and metaplasia in zone one. And then I want to show you this area here. So that's a portal tract. And you can see the structures. There's the hepatic arteriole there. And you've got the stem cell metaplasia at the periphery. And notice that there is no native duct there. How do we recognize native ducts? Well, sometimes it can be quite tricky. But a native bile duct, you want to look or find a duct that looks a bit like this where it's round, they tend to be darker staining than proliferating ducts, and it's round and smooth, there's no angulation. And I think there are a number probably of native ducts in this particular portal tract. So that would be a native duct, whereas over here, this I think could be a native duct, can be quite tricky as I said, but that is a proliferating duct. Notice the angulation. And there again is a native duct. So we can tell then that we've got uh, bile duct pathology. This supports the finding. Remember that you can never or should never diagnose with absolute certainty uh, on, uh, on immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry must always be used as a tool to support your H&E diagnosis. Never the other way around. You shouldn't make the H and E fit the immunistic chemistry. And then, unfortunately, I don't have a um, a P sixteen on this particular case uh, because uh, we had a little bit of problem with all the consumables. Um, there was, in fact, a worldwide shortage of immunistic chemistry reagents earlier on in the year, and uh, we didn't have P sixteen for quite a while. But uh, I'm happy that uh, the diagnosis here is one of secondary sclerosing cholangitis in a chronically ill patient. And I thought what I'd do is just briefly show you a, just a brief slide of that. And really just for the want, for the, for the purpose of, of um, uh, showing you, uh, showing the, the trainees certainly uh, what, are we, what is this? Uh, secondary sclerosing cholangitis. Can everybody see the slide, by the way? Can, can yes, you see yes, that? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. So, Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> don't worry. So, so secondary sclerosing cholangitis is a recently described entity. It uh, was originally reported in 2001, and it's abbreviated to SSC-CIP, and CIP meaning chronically ill patients. And um, it's typically found in patients that uh, have been admitted to ICU 
And by the nature of those admissions to ICU, they usually have serious illness, which includes infection, trauma, burns, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, and so on. The etiology is uh, thought to come about as a result of two possible causes. The first is bile duct ischemia, remembering that the bile ducts only get uh, their blood supply from the, um, from the hepatic arterioles only. So they don't have a dual sub blood supply like the rest of the liver. And then there is also this entity of so-called toxic bile. The bile itself is not toxic because it's normal bile. But what happens is that the combination or the mechanism is thought to be a combination of bile duct ischemia together with the toxic magnifications of bile uh, on the cholangiocytes. And that, uh, those together result in uh, epithelial necrosis of the bile ducts, the production of uh, cellular casts uh, resulting in biliary obstruction. So why does this bile duct ischemia come about? Well, the, the thoughts are that um, it uh, comes about because of circulatory instability. Uh, these patients typically are in, are in a shock situation with low blood pressure. Um, it's thought that vasopressor support which moves blood away, as we all know, from the abdominal region to the vital, uh, vital organs such as the brain and the heart. And that uh, further contributes to the circulatory instability in the abdomen. Hypercoagulable states are also thought to be a contributor. And it's interesting that this particular patient, and in fact, it has been identified this situation or this condition with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Sorry, there should be a hyphen in there. Um, and uh, we all know and have seen patients with uh, the hypercoagulable state secondary to SARS-CoV-2 infection. The next thing is uh, mechanical ventilation, which uh, uh, increases the intra-abdominal pressure, particularly if they have uh, high positive um, end pressures. And uh, the, um, that also is thought to cause uh, or contribute to the uh, bile duct ischemia. Then we've got this uh, toxic bile syndrome, and this what happens is that um, the mechanism is thought that uh, in 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 these particular patients there's impaired uh, uh, transport mechanisms which expose the uh, cholangiocytes to toxic bile salts. And one of these mechanisms is this impaired uh, bicarbonate secretion uh, by this uh, what's called A2. It's anion exchanger two or A2. And uh, that uh, results in the production of bicarbonate, which uh, changes the pH and protects the biliary epithelial cell from the bile. Interestingly enough, the cytokine storms are thought to precipitate A2 dysfunction. And as we know, once again, SARS-CoV-2 is associated with, um, uh, with, um, with cytokine storms. Interestingly enough, uh, it's supposed to result in intrahepatic bleeding, and it is said to get sparing of the extrahepatic tree, uh, which in this particular case, Bilal, we, we did not have. We had uh, uh, extrahepatic uh, involvement. And it is said that uh, uh, the, these patients, in fact, have a poor prognosis. So that's the end of that particular case. I don't know if there's any discussion, Bilal. Thanks. So, absolutely, Prof. I think so, because... You know, the, uh, and, and I see Prof Spearman's on, uh, online as well. And just in my reading that, uh, you know, they've come up with uh, at least the article that I found uh, uh, about 30 cases of patients that had um, this sort of presentation. And it's, it's a fairly rapidly progressive um, uh, sclerosis <clears throat> that occurs after um, uh, mechanical ventilation with um, with COVID, um, and and that and that was quite interesting. Additionally, I know now I've seen my first patient subsequent to COVID, uh, other autoimmune conditions developing. So um, a woman that didn't have any symptoms of PBC prior to developing COVID, um, she caught COVID also in June, July last year and has subsequently been diagnosed with, uh, with PBC. Prof Spearman, um, any comment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's quite interesting if we look at the ACE2 except receptor expression, it's about 20 times more higher in the 
biliary cholangiocytes and in the hepatocytes. So it is an area that can be targeted by SARS-CoV-2. Um, and initially it was thought, you know, we just saw a raise of fast and gamma GT, but as you quickly mentioned, sort of a month, six weeks down the line, people are starting to present with cholestasis associated with this very rapidly developing um, sclerosing cholangiopathy. Um, I mean, the other interesting thing is that in diabetics and obese individuals, it also looks like they might be more prone to this because, in fact, the ACE2 receptor expression is actually increased both in the hepatocytes and the cholangiocytes in that group of individuals. So it might be another reason why that they're more at risk of developing this, this, this problem. Um, but I think we also always need to remember drugs um, and particularly antibiotics. And so mm. things like comoxiclav, Bactam, flu clocks are also agents that often can be important cofactors and particularly these very sick patients have often been on multiple antibiotics as well. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that, Prof. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually see if I can find that article uh, that I was reading and see if I can post it on the chat if uh, possible, because I, uh, I found it quite, quite handy. Um, Anyone else uh, have any comment regarding this? And you know, I, I would certainly advise all the fellows to please go have a look at Prof Spearman's uh, review on uh, COVID and the liver that was published in Liver International last year. Um, it really was a fantastic, uh, 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 concise report on, on, on the hepatic manifestations. And if you are interested in that, um, please go have a look at that. Um, Bilal, I mean, one of the other reasons why in these patients who are mechanical ventilation and are hypotensive, why they might run into extra hepatic uh, manifestations is because of the sort of that watershed area in the common bile duct with supply from above and below. And so often if they have profound hypertension, that's an area particularly like similar in transplantation. It's, it's a... Mm relatively sort of Achilles heel for, for ischemia. And that might be why some of the sicker patients get extra hepatic involvement. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, let's perhaps move on then. Uh, uh, perhaps I could ask, uh, ask Prof Spear how many cases she's seen down it in Cape Town. So, I mean, we've actually didn't see an issue much in the beginning. We, we saw it towards the sort of Kind of about two months after the sort of delta, where we seem to have had a lot more hemodynamic instability. And so we, we're having patients, young patients, who've had background of having quite severe COVID now presenting with cholestatic uh, problems and on MRCP because if they've got intrahepatic and no other obvious risk factors besides the fact there are often multiple drugs that have been as well. So I think this is something that we're going to be seeing down the line. Um, and particularly if they don't have extrahepatic obstruction or strictures, it might be quite late that we actually pick it up and actually miss the connection with, with COVID. So I think we've mm. got at the moment, we're following up about um, eight cases, but I mean, those are the ones that have been referred to us. I think there's probably a lot more that we're probably going to see in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, just the prognosis for these patients is said to be pretty poor uh, of, of the 30 that were published in that series that I found. Uh, the majority have either been transplanted or have passed away. Um, so, so, so that's that's just a point of a point of concern. I'm sure there is still a spectrum of pathology, and we'll probably be learning more um, with this with this entity. Um, Prof, which case are we doing next? Let's do uh, SM. SM, right. Just, um, just to note, we are sitting at uh, just past five o'clock. Um, so we've got half an hour for the next two cases. This is a 41-year-old uh, young lady, retroviral disease, um, uh, with retroviral disease on tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir. Who class one, CD4 of 671, and viral load was lower than detectable limit. Um, she, uh, she had an infiltrative liver function test um, that she was, she was referred uh, for uh, our assessment. 
Um, we weren't 100% certain what was, uh, what was causing this. MRCP was, uh, uh, was normal, so we elected to do a liver biopsy. The autoimmune uh, panel was negative. Over to you, Prof. Okay, thanks, Blau. Right, so can you see that screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. All right, so this is uh, another interesting case. And um, once again, we've got uh, plenty of tissue. Sorry about the scratches on the slide. Don't make cover slips like they used to. And um, what we've got is you can see that the pathology is, is largely in the, in the portal tracts. So you've got these expanded portal tracts. The actual parenchyma itself looks to be reasonably all right. But there's certainly a significant, significant expansion of the portal tracts. And then when we have a look at these portal tracts, we start at this one here. And we can see that we've got uh, the vein, the artery, uh, lots of inflammation, and no duct. Duct has disappeared. And then you come to this area here. And one sees a granuloma. This is another portal tract. You can see the, the portal vein there. And it looks as though the hepatic arteriole, in fact, has, has also been overrun. Uh, by this uh, by this process, but you can see that there are large numbers of epithelioid histiocytes in this. The granuloma is well circumscribed, and uh, there's this cuff of lymphocytes at the periphery, and no evidence of central necrobiosis. And that looks very much like a sarcoidal granuloma. Uh, why, Martin? Uh, sorry, Chris, you say, uh, why? Why sarcoidal? Uh, because it's, um, yeah, good question, Chris. So um, why sarcoidal? Because... I mean, in Africa, obviously, TB is going to be our big one, two, five, and ten. <laughs> yeah, except we have to try to sort that out. <laughs> and, uh, um, so a sarcoidal granuloma... Okay, so, I mean, there's nothing that's ever absolute about granulometer, as we know, and in fact, they can be an absolute nightmare to sort out in the, in the liver, both from a histopathological point of view, and also from you guys as, as physicians, uh, trying to work out why, because the causes are as, I mean, as long as a piece of string, quite honestly, uh, ranging from infections to drugs to all sorts of potential causes. And of course, the list of drugs is also enormous. So why is this sarcoidal? Well, for a start, the first thing is that uh, it's round, okay? So uh, TB, the, uh, the granuloma to tend to be irregular at the periphery. You also get central necrobiosis, um, which uh, is, uh, results in the caseous necrosis notwithstanding the fact that in sarcoids you can also get um, you can also get fibrinoid necrosis in the center. Now necrobiosis of uh, tuberculosis tends to be more basophilic, whereas the necrobiosis in sarcoid is more eosinophilic because it's a fibrinoid necrosis. The other thing that uh, with sarcoid is that we we call these sarcoid or granulometer clean granulometer. And um, the, uh, whereas in tuberculosis, often you get an admixture of inflammatory cells actually intermingled in the center of the granuloma as well, lymphocytes and plasma cells and so on. But this fairly clear zonation uh, is fairly typical of a sarcoidal granuloma. And when I say sarcoidal granuloma, uh, it um, doesn't necessarily mean that it is 
definitely sarcoid. So a lot of drugs can cause this picture as well. And one of the drugs that immediately comes to mind uh, are the interferon antag antagonists. And I remember a patient that, um, that Prof Song had uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember that patient. Yeah. Had, yeah. Um, the patient had a large liver and liver biopsy was done. And uh, there were wall to wall granulometer throughout the parenchyma. Uh, secondary, I can't, it was an imatinib, wasn't it? If I remember correctly. Or no, I, I think it wasn't. Uh, I think it was infliximab. Was it infliximab? Infliximab. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was war to war. It was an, I know it was an anti, uh, interferon antagonist. And this particular patient was an older woman. I think she was in her 70s, if I remember correctly, uh, with hepatomegaly. And um, it was. Uh, this was granulomatous hepatitis that was caused by, um, um, by, by drugs, drug induced. So not, so when I say sarcoidal, uh, could, be, could be drug induced. Um, and then uh, if we go to, to this area here, we see, for example, that uh, this is the portal tract, another portal tract, vein, artery, and an absence of bile ducts. And that picture repeats itself. So we come to this portal tract here. And we see again, a fairly dense inflammatory infiltrate. We've got the arteriole. Um, I think this is the arteriole here, this is the vein. And then you've got uh, quite a dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, uh, quite a few plasma cells, for example, in this region here. There are also plasma cells up in this part of the, the screen here as well. So another case then of vanishing bile duct syndrome. And um, then we've got to go and try and once again work out the cause. So here's another area here to show you uh, a native duct. And in this particular area, you can see that we've got lymphocytes that are infiltrating into uh, the uh, biliary epithelium. These are lymphocytes that are migrating in. We're losing the biliary epithelial cells. Okay, right, so now I want to go back a couple of other areas. Sure, just check that I haven't missed anything. So this portal tract again, a big, nice portal tract to demonstrate this uh, very neatly demonstrated the artery, a um, couple of the venous radicals, and uh, once again, a quite a dense lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrate. Um, suggesting that there's probably a bit of an autoimmune component to this. And I use the word autoimmune in a fairly loose context um, because I think sarcoid often is, has some autoimmune sort of features. And uh, here you've got uh, plasma cells as well, a little bit of interface inflammatory activity. I don't recall whether the immunoglobulins were elevated, but there's another, bar, there's another portal tract and you can see again, these portal, there's the artery. You can see these clean granuloma. Uh, so Chris, yeah, clean granulometer is a feature of these sort of sarcoidal granuloma. Then I want to go back to this area here, which I glossed over. The beginning intentionally, but there is a granuloma now that's sitting in the parenchyma. Okay, and nice, neat, and tidy peripheral cuff of lymphocytes, epithelioid histiocytes. And that is a typical sort of sarcoidal like granuloma. Yes, it could be drug induced, but it's unlikely to be TB. And then when we look at the um,
at the Sirius Red, one of the tricks that we can use Quite sure why I put a dot here. Yeah. Okay. So one of the tricks that we can use is to look for collagen, because we're trying to separate out TB granulomata from sarcoidal granulomata, and sarcoidal granulomata show this typical perigranulomatous collagenization and fibrosis, which you tend not to get with TB. So for us, that's a fairly good indicator that this is unlikely to be tuberculous. And then there's another granuloma down here. It's a small one, but nevertheless, everything helps. Small evidence again. This is a granuloma. These are the epithelioid histiocytes, and you've got this perigranulomatous fibrosis. And then I want to show you the CK7. And the CK7, did I touch anything? Yes. So there is the CK7 in the, showing you the native bile duct there, for example, with a little bit of stem cell proliferation at the periphery. Uh, another bile duct there. Notice the attenuation of that duct. That I think is quite significant. Normal bile duct shouldn't look like that. But there you've got a normal duct in cross section. And then you've got another portal tract there, which shows stem cell metaplasia and no evidence of a native duct. And likewise, there again. And then last but not least, to show you P16. And the P16 is a good marker of biliary senescence. And I think it's important to only assess the P16 in the native ducts, because with proliferating bile ducts, one would expect them to be dying anyway. But this is a native duct. And here you can see that you've got positive cytoplasmic staining. And I think probably a little bit of nuclear staining in that one, in that nucleus there, and cytoplasmic staining there. That could be a lymphocyte. Not sure about that. And then. Um, That's that attenuated bile duct. And here you can see that there's quite striking staining uh, in several areas uh, in this native duct. You can see that we've got positive staining in the nuclei. We've got positive cytoplasmic staining. So we've got epithelial senescence, secondary to basically granulomatous inflammation. And then we've got to work it all out. Could this be a PBC? Well, the markers were negative. There's no copper associated protein. Could this be an HIV cholangiopathy? Unlikely because we've got a, we've got a granulomatous cause. There's no acid fast bacilli or anything like that. Um, could be an evolving PBC into the future. Uh, could it be sarcoid? We know that sarcoid is associated with the vanishing bile duct syndrome. So yeah, that, and it could also be drugs. So it's a little bit open in terms of the etiology, but she's got infiltrative lung disease, uh, which would also go along with the sarcoidal diagnosis. Over to you, Bill. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Prof. Um, yeah, I, I can't really give you an update uh, on this patient. So uh, she's one of my colleagues, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not 100% certain how she's gone. I just have, uh, I see here that uh, she was placed on some prednisolone um, on, on, on discharge, I don't have a subsequent follow-up uh, follow on her. Um, it's uh, 17 minutes past, let's get on to our next case. Um, just one thing, I think that was, that was an anti-TNF agent 
prof uh, that that uh, prof song patient was exposed to you're muted yeah thanks but i i can't remember yeah. i just remember i was actually i think yeah. we were all quite astounded at the number of granular yeah. yeah. that were present in that i remember that case yeah um our final patient then um let me call up his notes so this oh, this is a yeah he was just trying to find out how old he was. Here we are. 59 year old gentleman, uh, diabetic, hypertensive, ischemic heart disease uh, as a background, medication wise. Uh, medication wise, humulin, carvitolol, um, uh, metformin, aspirin, uh, uh, and, and, and simvastatin. Um, this gentleman um, was, was, you know, was a typical liver patient in that um, we, you know, brought him in and we uh, worked him up and looked for all sorts of things, um, trying to figure out where and what uh, he, uh, or what was causing this infiltrative LFT. We eventually advised on a, on a liver biopsy. Now this was in April, um, and lo and behold, the uh, COVID wave started. Um, this is last year again. And so he elected not to come in only until September. Um, in September, as you know, part of, part of our digging, we, we, we had asked him, what other medication were you on? Um, what other medication were you on six months prior to onset of symptoms? And at that point, he, he, he let us know that he took uh, Puricos or Allopurinol for a short period of time and then stopped it because he felt unwell, uh, unwell with it and had forgotten to mention, mention that. Um, this gentleman was intensely pruritic, uh, no xantholoma uh, or xantholasma uh, uh, noted on, on screening. Um, Prof, over to you. Thanks, Bilal. So this is another interesting case, and it really just goes to show how you've really got to dig into the history, the drug history. And I, I always say that, you know, when I get these biopsies, I spend probably two thirds of my time looking up the manifestations of the drug influence on, on the liver uh, compared to actually actually looking at the biopsy itself and trying to, trying to piece together a puzzle. And sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. And in this particular instance, we were lucky uh, because what happened, in fact, in some ways, it, we, we sort of, we said, well, this is a vanishing bile duct syndrome. And uh, Bilal, I remember you went back and you said, look, <laughs> as you said, you've got to tell us what else you were on. And then, mm. then it all sort of slotted together very nicely because I think it's very important. And we were all, all know that, uh, you, you know, patients do tell a story and uh, that story does need to be complete. And it's the same with the histopathology, it's all got to fit together. So anyway, so we've got a nice, uh, nice biopsy and straight away, oh, sorry, I must share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So straight away, you can see, uh, just at the end of the biopsy, that we've got a problem in the portal tracts. Uh, the portal tracts are expanded, they're looking a little bit busy. There's a bit of cellular infiltration. There seems to be some bile ductular proliferation. And when you see this sort of thing, you think to yourself, no, there has to be a bile duct problem here. There's no evidence of any interface inflammatory activity in this particular portal tract. But uh, the bile ducts that we've got in this uh, portal tract uh, do look rather, they're under pressure really. You know, you can see that you've got this proliferation, you've got this, Anisocyte, uh, nuclear anisocytosis. I think some of these are proliferating. I think this might be a native duct, but these certainly are proliferating bile ductules. Um, there's also a bit of stem cell metaplasia, which is taking place at the periphery. And as we move down, you can see that picture is replicated. You can see the stem cell metaplasia, for example, in this area here. These are all stem cells that are proliferating at the edge. And these are proliferating bile ductules. And this rather busy looking uh, um, 
uh, infiltration, inflammatory infiltrate. Now, when we go down through the biopsy, we come to this sort of thing here. And I know this is on the edge of the biopsy, but having seen that earlier on, you look at this and you say, well, where's the bile duct? Yes, I suppose the bile duct could be here, but you've certainly got to be very suspicious when you see this sort of thing, because we've got a phallic arteriole which is sitting on its own. And the bile duct should be in the vicinity. It shouldn't really be over here. It should be in this region over here. So we come down, so we think that, yes, this is probably a vanishing bile duct syndrome. We come to this area here. Once again, the native ducts have disappeared. You've got this ductular proliferation. And um, then when you look uh, again in the, in the interface area, you've got this ductular proliferation. Quite a lot of neutrophils. Neutrophils and bile duct proliferation, proliferation go together. So you've got to think of things like ascending cholangitis uh, in this particular patient as well. Although clinically, he didn't really uh, have that. And then you come to these areas here, another portal tract, and you can see that um, we've got the uh, artery and uh, the bile duct is there. But if you look at these biliary epithelial cells, you can see that the cytoplasmic pallo, there's um, uh, cytoplasmic vacuolation, and every cell sort of tells a story. It's all, all part of the storybook, if you like, of bile duct disease. You've got to look at the whole thing in, uh, in total, because every cell tells a little bit, a bit more, a bit like reading a novel, really. You can't, you can't tell what the novel's about just by looking at one page. You've got to look at the whole thing. And um, anyway, and then the same sort of thing happening there. But there, of course, you've got a nice native duct, and that's fine. And notice the size of the bile duct in comparison to the arteriole. The, the, roughly the same. That's, that should be the, the situation, that the, that the bile duct is usually approximately the same size as the hepatic arteriole. And then you come to this area here, and you say, well, where's the bile duct gone? It's disappeared. So let's have a look then, in the interest of time, at the orcine. And the orcine, lo and behold, shows copper. And I said uh, earlier on that, you know, when we find copper, you've got to think, God, that is a sinister thing. And this is not just a small amount of copper. This is significant copper. Look at this. Abundant intracytoplasmic copper in the zone one of hepatocytes. You can see in this portal tract, there's an element of bioductular proliferation as well. So you've got this abundant copper, which says to us, yes, this patient has got uh, uh, cholangiopathic pathology. And then more copper, for example, down here, situated in the, in, in the zone one hepatocytes. Oops. And then we have a look at the CK7. CK7, once again, continues the story. And if you look there, you can see you've got this florid bile ductular proliferation in the interface zone. Uh, and I'm not sure if we've got a native duct there or not. I don't really like that for a native duct. Could be, but it is a little bit angulated. These certainly are not native ducts. None of those are native ducts. Then you look at that area there, no native duct, no native duct. Yeah, that could be a native duct, two native ducts possibly there and there, but you've got this ductular proliferation. And then when we look at the, at the P16, once again for epithelial senescence, and perhaps I should just briefly explain the P16, remember that in the cell cycle, uh, you've got the accelerators, uh, the cyclin-dependent kinases, uh, those are pushing cell division, and then you've got the cell breaks, and uh, one of them is P16. And um, there is a native duct. Nice round native duct, and you've got cytoplasmic expression and nuclear expression of P16. I think there is some more somewhere else as well, as I recall. And if you're concerned about that, and one should always, 
always make sure and be absolutely sure that you're interpreting correctly. But there's a native duct there. This is another native duct. And you can see you've got strong cytoplasmic and nuclear expression of P16. So this gentleman has vanishing bile duct syndrome. And then Bilal went back, quizzed him, and uh, he then we then heard about the allopurinol. So this is allopurinol-induced vanishing bile duct syndrome. And it's quite frightening when you consider that so many people are on allopurinol. But yeah, it's well described. Thanks, Bilal. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, the last case. And bang on time, Prof. So well done. We've well, got, uh, I think, a minute or two for uh, comment. And um, uh, I'd like to open the floor for that. Um, uh, so below Prof. Two Mashika, things you, I, yeah, oh, Chris, sorry, sorry, of course. Just, yeah. um, no, no, no. Mash, if you want. Um, just two things. There is a question which you might want to Got it, yes. Ponder. And then secondly, Martin, perhaps for our audience, I'm sure they're aware of the fantastic, and I know it's your first port of call for um, drug-induced liver injury is Liver Tox, the wonderful website um, that Jay Hufnagel initiated, run by the NIH. And, and the important thing is not only that it's so accessible, but it's so up-to-date and uh, a very a good um, sort of portal uh, um, for you to use when considering and drug-induced liver injury. No, absolutely, uh, liver tox. I think uh, we, we we use it on a daily basis, uh, and I'm sure anyone who takes liver disease seriously uh, uses it very regularly as well. Um, Prof. Mashiko, Prof. Uh, uh, Wendy, uh, any 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 further comment? Uh, Mashiko, do you want to go first? No, I have no comments. Thanks, Bilal. Thanks, so, so just going back to your, the second patient was these, probably sarcoid. Did, did we have a, did we have a cess level on that patient? Yes, uh, it was normal. Okay. So, I mean, one of the, one of the problems with sarcoidosis and vanishing bowel duct syndrome, they unfortunately don't respond as well to steroid therapy. Uh, once you start losing the bowel ducts, it seems to take a life on its own. So, they, it, it's quite problematic. They tend to run into trouble uh, quite quickly. Um, and so even if you get on top of that initial inflammation, the prognosis is often quite poor. Um, we've also seen patients who've actually developed because of quite significant granulomas, combination of granulomas within the extrahepatic ducts, as well as lymph node um, compression, developing quite significant extrahepatic involvement as well. So these are often have a very aggressive course. Um, and I think we've transplanted two patients for sarcoid. One of the problems is that the sarcoid mm. can actually recur post-transplantation as well. Yeah. Um, and and they've, we've usually been quite aggressive in our immunosuppression with them. And sometimes always a bit reluctant to bring in azathioprine in the setting of a cholestatic liver injury. So in those patients, we've often brought in MMF quite early. Thanks. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's, that's similar to what, what we do here. Just out of curiosity, um, and, and I, I can't say I've used it, but I found it in the reviews. And this, uh, Sianda, this is, 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 uh, is answering your question, where he's asked, um, does the treatment of sarcoid hepatitis differ from, uh, from the lung disease? Um, so, you know, uh, the use of methotrexate um, and, 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 and treatment of hepatic sarcoid, have you, have you Consider using that? Uh, we're always very cautious with methotrexate. Yeah. I mean, uh, Dr. Kaplan from the Mayo was always very pro methotrexate with primary biliary cholangitis. But yeah. our experience with methotrexate hasn't been, yeah, hasn't been favorable. So we, we tend to steer away so, from it. Uh, yeah, similarly, we haven't, we haven't used any, uh, methotrexate for, for, for those purposes, but then Siandra, so then um, azathioprine, uh, is is is, uh, is is your is one of your options? Um, oxycholic acid in terms of uh, um, uh, hepatic isolated hepatic disease, um, you can consider that. Um, you know the, the problem with sarcoid is that it's often multisystemic and 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 therefore um, drugs such as then your your budesonide and and uh, and acidioxycholic acid, which would target specifically the liver may not necessarily be great choices because 
even though you may the, the liver might, might be the predominant feature, you may then miss other uh, foci of, of, of disease activity and which wouldn't be covered. Um, but uh, yeah, Prof, any further comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think those, I mean, often they have multi-system involvement, like you say, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things is that the lungs often respond quite rapidly to, to the steroids. And so there's this tendency to rapidly wean the steroid and you then see the severe, quite a severe flare in the liver. So I think you need to tailor your immunosuppression to your liver rather than to your, even the eyes or the, or the lungs, yeah. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Guys, I think uh, it is uh, three minutes now past. So I'd like to thank Professor, Professor Hale for those fantastic cases um, and, and, and uh, you know, for the, for the wonderful discussion um, uh, with all of them. Um, I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as, much as we did. Uh, obviously wanting to thank uh, the University of New Mexico um, uh, uh, COVID team uh, and, and uh, the India ECHO team for, for hosting this. Um, we'd like uh, to promote, oh, this, is, is that correct? Wednesday, 17th of March, IBD. No, it's, it's the wrong, no, it's the wrong one. <laughs> it looks, it looks so, it. Apologies, so, so, apologies. No, don't up. worry, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's pediatric okay. IBD next week. Uh, it's pediatric IBD next week. With, okay, with so David Young. Yeah. Uh, David, no, David, David Webstein. D David, David, yeah, David, David will be Epstein. around. Mishika, Jill Watermeyer, and Tim will give us some pediatric views. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Guys, thank you so much, and enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Martin. Okay, thanks, pleasure. Wendy. Nice to thank, see you all. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, thanks Bilal, as usual. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yes. And all Thanks. our colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa, great to have you all on board. Thank you.